Good morning, everyone. My name is Michał Zielinski. I just came from Poland yesterday evening. This is my first time here, and I really like it. So I'm really gl glad to be here um, for the first time uh, for, for this Azure Day. Um, I'm uh, part of Microsoft, as you can see on this, on this slide. I work for Microsoft for roughly 10 years already. Um, and what I'm doing, on a, you know, my role is basically trying to help customers and partners build proper solutions on top of Microsoft Cloud. And to be specific, I'm an um, advanced analytics and uh, artificial intelligence specialist. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, quite a common topic nowadays, which is uh, basically how to build a, a proper big data solution using, uh, using Microsoft Azure. What are the alternatives when it comes to different uh, sets of services? Uh, and moreover, we'll try to compare and contrast them to uh, some open source projects that are commonly used on the market as well. Uh, so it will be basically uh, all about Lambda architecture, and uh, the agenda for this session is as follows. We'll first start with uh, uh, explaining what the Lambda architecture really is, especially for those of you who are new to this topic. Why may you probably consider it in some real uh, cases? I will give you a brief history of Lambda architecture and also what are maybe some alternatives to Lambda. Um, then we'll try to focus on two uh, real-life uh, examples. Uh, I'll just pick two of the projects that I've been uh, recently involved in uh, that basically relied on Lambda and uh, how they were implemented and uh, how they could or w were uh, optimized. Uh, then we'll try to, uh, as I said, uh, uh, take a, a bunch of Azure services and look uh, at those uh, more closely, because I assume that not each of you are fully familiar with uh, some of these. So I'll try to compare them both from the technical perspective and also from the business perspective, how to choose them wisely. And then at the very end, there will be some things to consider as a summary. So let's get started. Lambda history is basically uh, not a new one. Uh, it actually all started in 2011, so six years ago. Um, it has been invented or uh, formally uh, uh, described by the guy called Nathan Martz. Uh, he's actually quite famous because uh, he's also a creator of uh, Apache Storm project. Um, it, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at it, it all started with just a single blog post or article called, uh, called How to Beat Cap Theorem. It's still widely available. I bas basically collected also some uh, references to all those materials at the last slide. So if you would be interested in digging deeper into this information, you can easily uh, have a look at it. If you look at uh, what happened six years ago, or uh, actually what was the state of the of the IT business, and to be specific, Hadoop business, because we are all talking during this session about big data solutions. Um, actually, this was uh, Hadoop version one, right? So you can see on this, on this picture, uh, I just uh, found it on the internet. It's actually coming from Caldera conference. This was uh, the stack of uh, Hadoop in 2011. So V1, so there was no YARN, no resource manager, uh, the modern one. Uh, Storm has just been released, so no wonder uh, Mr. Nathan uh, not just explained uh, how he would see the future of Hadoop, but he also tried to somehow make something practical out of it, and this is why uh, he started Storm Project. Uh, there was no uniformity, meaning uh, all those components that you see on this picture were very loosely connected. It was the moment in time when uh, the Hadoop as an idea bursted, and there were a lot of separate, um, separate organizations that were working on, 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 the, on this project uh, without real connectivity. Uh, and by the way, it was also the year when Hortonworks company has just been founded. So they've, they've become separate from Yahoo, and all the inventors of, of, um, of uh, Hadoop has just joined Hortonworks as a, as a separate entity. Uh, still, uh, it was also the time when Lambda has been somehow started, started to gain adoption. Uh, I mentioned Yahoo already, but also Netflix, where um, definitely uh, Lambda's are uh, advocates. So let's look at uh, what I'm actually talking about, right? That was the history. What is actually Lambda? Lambda is actually a very uh, easy, easy com concept for those of you who have not yet uh, touched Lambda at all. 
it just consists of three major layers or components. The first one is batch layer, so this is basically the place when we are dealing with a lot of computation, quite often a lot of data as well, and that's something that was served pretty well by uh, Hadoop. Even in version one, this was basically the main purpose of Hadoop, to do, uh, to, to do properly uh, batch, uh, batch processing. Um, on the other hand, there was a need back then, and all, uh, it, it becomes even more uh, important nowadays, to serve and to provide some information faster than uh, Hadoop used to do. So there was this notion of speed layer, so near real-time response, low latency, low accuracy, potentially, co because there is always a, a, a trade-off, uh, um, had to be pro uh, provided by separate layer, and this is uh, the, the idea of, of having, having it separate as a, as a speed layer. And then there was also an idea of, uh, of serving layer, which is um, sort of a cache for both of those sources uh, to be collected together. So quite often, serving layer is basically the one that is directly connected to some external systems like dashboards, reports, applications, etc. And quite, quite often, serving layer is basically a um, usual relational database. It can be SQL database in, let's say, Azure case. So obviously, as I said, it's uh, six uh, years long, uh, old, so uh, there uh, has been some critiques. Uh, and also some alternatives to Lambda as well. Because if you think of it, there are a couple of uh, issues with Lambda. First of all, it's really complex to maintain, especially when it just uh, has been born. Uh, you can't actually find a single tool or a single framework that could achieve this goal. So what actually happened, you, need, you needed to, uh, to construct it using multiple tools, different technologies. And that basically means that to maintain it in a production system, it, 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 it uh, quite often uh, has become very complex. Uh, it's also quite complex from the developer perspective, because you are not learning a single tool, but you need to actually focus on, uh, on multiple of them. Um, so you, you need to maintain separate code for the, the streaming layer, for, uh, for, for batch layer, and, and serving la uh, layer as well. So, Again, as you may guess, IT industry uh, is not willing to, uh, to stop uh, the inventions, and there were, there were some alternatives to, to Lambda, like Kappa, invented in LinkedIn. Uh, it basically uh, is, a, is a flavor of Lambda, or a, a similar concept to Lambda, that basically tries to simplify the concept and get rid of batch layer, in this case, focused purely on speed layer. So, the idea behind Kappa is to use speed layer to also do a batch processing. So it's basically connected to the fact that the, the current modern uh, IT hardware is capable enough to provide uh, uh, enough resources for, uh, for batch processing inside the, the, sp the speed, uh, speed layer as well. And there were also, or there are also some unified frameworks like Spark, which is probably the most uh, common, commonly used um, uh, big data project nowadays. Nowadays, um, and I will be talking about Spark in a few minutes. For those of you who don't know Spark or have not used Spark at all, uh, so Spark basically provides you with this unified interface for all those different uh, different uh, different layers altogether. So, uh, how the usual Lambda architecture looks like. Um, this is a, a generic picture that consists of uh, basically open source components. So, if you look at the market, probably still most of the solutions are built using this sort of component. So, obviously, it all starts with some data. It doesn't matter really what this data is coming from. Uh, when it comes to data ingestion, uh, most of the uh, most of the projects that at least I've been involved in are using Apache Kafka. I mean open source, uh, I mean uh, on-premises uh, project. Uh, and then Kafka uh, is connected to different layers, as I said. So on the batch side, there is usually Hadoop or Spark. Uh, so the data lands directly into some sort of uh, distributed storage. When it comes to Hadoop, it's, uh, 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 it is HDFS. And then we've got some streaming layers, so quite often this is, for example, Storm. Uh, and then uh, we've got some serving layer, which might be basically anything, as I said. It can be relational database or NoSQL uh, no database. I just picked Cassandra, HBase, or MongoDB. Uh, and then the last part is obviously some, some application or dashboard or report that uh, basically 
uh, is consumed by the end users. So this is basically how you can, you, can, you can look at those components. Those are the three layers that I've described uh, right now. The, the other way of looking at it is also uh, at the speed of the processing, right? So uh, usually if you look at uh, also Microsoft's documentation, we quite often talk about cold path and hot path. So cold, pa cold path is basically uh, this long-term processing that usually might take hours, days even, uh, but it's very accurate uh, and relies on some uh, heavy processing. On the other hand, we've got hot paths that basically is almost real time, or it's supposed to be uh, almost real time, and uh, serves kind of different purpose. So uh, it does not, you, does not provide you with full accuracy. You can, cannot have like a full view onto, onto the data, but for some very specific scenarios, this is definitely sufficient. So let's talk about uh, two case studies or uh, scenarios that I've been, I've been involved in. This is the first one, a fleet monitoring system. Uh, there was one company that has built this solution, or actually this was still, uh, let's say, in the proof of concept phase. Uh, so they, they had this uh, uh, proof of concept built using uh, on-premises uh, components. Uh, as you may have guessed, it's kind of maybe not so basic, but still from the architectural perspective, kind of basic system. So there are some uh, cars, trucks to be specific in this case, connected to uh, uh, containing some sensors and those sensors are being connected to some remote system. So the, the whole communication has been built using uh, RabbitMQ uh, and the events or messages that appear in RabbitMQ uh, are also being sent to Kafka. Uh, the reason why they decided, and obviously this is not my idea, so I can, uh, I can have a different opinion on, on this architecture, uh, which you will see in a minute. Uh, the reason why they decided to go with Rabbit and Kafka at the same time, even though those two components serve very similar purpose, was basically trying to separate uh, and provide additional layer of security between Rabbit and, and Kafka. So Rabbit was exposed to the external world and Kafka was uh, used on, uh, only for internal purposes. So it's like a DMZ, uh, DMZ zone uh, that uh, RabbitMQ uh, was, uh, uh, was being uh, uh, located in. So there is Kafka. Um, there is also for batch processing, there is HBase. So actually they decided to throw all the uh, uh, signals into HBase uh, cluster. For this batch processing, that they, they, they went with Spark. And then, for some reasons, they, uh, they also uh, have built the, the, the streaming layer using Apache Storm. So uh, it all has been orchestrated using uh, also quite interesting project called Apache NiFi. If you don't know what uh, NiFi is, this is a kind of orchestrator, quite similar to, say, uh, Azure Data Factory. Uh, or or Airflow. Uh, so it provides you with this nice visual uh, uh, experience when it comes to constructing certain data flows. So it can very easily connect to, for example, uh, Kafka streams and call certain, certain routines coming from Storm or, or, or some other systems. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, at the very, very end, both Kafka and HBase were, were connected to, to some custom application. They actually built I believe it, will, it was Node.js app to visualize and report the, uh, the, the, the tracks on some, uh, on some maps. So that was, that was, that was the, the existing system. It took them, I believe, roughly six months to uh, complete without actually doing any performance testing. It was really working ra rather on a, on, a, on a small scale. And then they were asked by the customer uh, to actually connect it to the, the real trucks. And they realized that probably it's not the best idea because they were actually software developers. They do not have any DevOps uh, team or uh, actually they were rather researchers even, not, uh, not uh, developers. So it was a kind of research project for them. So they were kind of sh scared of you know, putting all those components out of their existing infrastructure. This is why they decided to move uh, as much as possible to some, so, some sort of cloud solution. And this is we, w w where we actually meet. The second case, uh, the second case 
is um, a different partner. Uh, this one is actually collecting uh, um, session information out of the browsers for market, uh, marketing automation purposes. Uh, so you can see a lot of browsers connected uh, through some sort of API to once again uh, Kafka cluster. Um, and then a uh, similar case. So uh, they are not using Storm. They are using Spark for both uh, stream, uh, stream processing and also uh, batch processing. Uh, all the data lands in HBase for long-term storage. And what is different compared to the, to the first case uh, is the fact that they are uh, using uh, a custom-built, um, let's say, query engine uh, to provide uh, a proper experience to marketing departments. Uh, the challenge that they see is actually this custom, this, this custom component, because even though we are talking about short-term data here, by the fact that they, have, they are rapidly growing now and they have uh, probably more than a couple of thousands customers connected to this multi-tenant solution already. Even short-term da data consists of probably uh, more than, uh, I believe, uh, 100 gigs uh, of, uh, of data that for now is being kept in memory. So they needed to build a distributed in-memory um, query engine to deal with these cases. And this, this is basically the bottleneck of, uh, of the current solution. And this engine is connected uh, once again to some custom apps. So we are not touching apps. We are not obviously touching the data sources. It's just about optimizing or uh, trying to think of, uh, you know, applying certain common cloud patterns on top of those uh, of those um, architectures. So uh, how Lambda is officially proposed by Microsoft when it comes to Azure? This is um, this is the set of services that can be quite easily compared to the previous slide when I was talking about usual, let's say, open source approach. Um, so once again, we are some consumers. We've, we've got some, uh, some data generators. Uh, there are quite uh, a few services that are coming out of the box that you may apply as well. So first of all, we've got Event Hubs instead of Kafka. We've got Stream Analytics that might be useful as well. Uh, we obviously have multiple ways of store the data for the, you know, for the long-term uh, purposes. Uh, and then on top of this data, we can either connect, for example, HD Insight service or maybe some others to start the batch processing. Um, we also have a, a lot of machine learning alternatives if there is a need for, for machine learning models. Uh, and then when it comes to the serving layer, we've got SQL Data Warehouse or SQL DB or uh, maybe some others. So the question is, how can you actually choose properly which kind of component to choose? Because by the way, we can just take it as it is, right? So take all those, uh, uh, all these, for example, components and throw them into Azure uh, as they are. It's just a matter of probably a few days to have them pro properly configured, and that's basically it. So let's look closely at each of those um, ma major, let's say, components. So let's start with Apache Kafka. Um, there is a reason why is it uh, uh, used so, uh, so heavily now. Uh, it's probably the most uh, popular project when it comes to high throughput mes uh, 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 message brokers. Um, mostly because it's part of Hadoop. And as you probably know already, if you're doing anything with open source, it's all driven by the number of contributors and also the surrounding projects. So being, making Kafka part of Hadoop and having formal support and blessing coming flow from Cloudera and Hortonworks makes it definitely easier for developers to, uh, to commit to this particular technology. That means also that there are a lot of available client libraries, examples, very strong community. So this is like a default choice for many, uh, many, uh, many developers. Uh, it implements publish subscribe pattern using topics. Uh, it does provide obviously high availability and scalability, uh, meaning scaling out uh, using p partitioned instances. It's very similar to what actually comes together with uh, Event Hubs. So if you look from the architectural perspective, it's very, very similar to Event Hubs. It does provide four major APIs for producers, consumers, connectors, and streams, which is kind of a uh, new addition to those APIs, which basically means that you can uh, not just collect the data, but you can apply certain, um, certain processing inside Kafka service, which is not maybe commonly used and commonly known but it's still, it's still there. So usually what people start with is 
producer and consumer, obviously. This is the, uh, the major case. Connector is mostly for people willing to build some sort of, well, connectors to Kafka, obviously. So I also mentioned event hubs, and, and it's good to somehow, uh, you know, compare those two services. So first of all, when it comes to protocols, uh, both of them support HTTP REST. Uh, event Hub uh, also includes AMQP, which is definitely relevant if you're doing any IoT systems. Uh, even though we've, we've got also IoT Hub as well, so uh, you, you should remember about it as well. Uh, integration, well, as I said, Kafka is very popular. So uh, when it comes to those connectors, you can find pretty much all the open source projects there. It can be Spark, HBase, NiFi, uh, probably Cassandra, Mongo, etc. So it's very easy to to integrate it with existing open source projects. On the other hand, Event Hubs doesn't have such a big support for, again, kind of obvious reasons, because this is proprietary solution, so it's not uh, so commonly adopted across open source community. But it's, uh, it has still very nice connection to, for example, Stream Analytics or Azure Functions, and it comes together with nice archival way of, of storing the data. Uh, scalability. Basically, same idea, right? So you are relying on partition, uh, uh, on, on data partitioning and consumer groups. The pricing is different. Uh, by the way, when it comes to this sort of comparisons, I'm talking about the services that are running on top of Azure, right? This is Azure Day, so there is no, uh, uh, and there, are, there are no discussions comparing um, Kafka, for example, on, on top of some on-premises infrastructure. So if you'd like to run uh, Apache Kafka as a managed service, by the way, because this is also supported as a managed service inside Azure, uh, you are just being charged by number of hours of and number of virtual machines that will be allocated for this particular service. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when it comes to event hubs, you are being charged by number of events. So there is a notion of these uh, units that are be basically being pre-allocated for your job, and then you are being charged for the throughput. So in most of the cases, this is much more flexible and you will pay less using uh, event hubs. Um, event hubs is for obviously a non-cross-platform uh, uh, non solution. Kafka can reside on any uh, platform in any cloud vendor or on-prem. Um, when it comes to uh, significant technical differences, uh, there are some constraints with event hubs when it comes to the message size. So uh, the maximum message size is uh, 256 uh, kilobytes. There is no hard limit when it comes to message size in Kafka. The default is one megabyte. Well, obviously you may wonder whether it makes sense to send you know, really huge messages over, uh, over such system. I would say in most of the cases, definitely no. So there should be no, uh, no, uh, no challenge with this sort of message sizes. Uh, but still you need to, to know about th those differences. So if for some reason you, you are expecting to, to, to have uh, large messages or large events, then uh, Kafka might be a better, op better option. The other important thing is retention period, and this is actually something that I'm facing uh, uh, quite often. Uh, Kafka-based systems are, uh, well, maybe not often, but still uh, can be configured to store the information for a longer, longer period of time. So people, for example, use Kafka clusters to keep data for, let's say, 30 days. Don't know if it makes sense or not, but this is basically how they, they, uh, they architected the system. In Event Hub, this is fixed and uh, it's up to seven days. So there is definitely a difference here. Just be aware of it. Architecture, uh, I mentioned that uh, Apache Kafka comes as a managed solu solution. But this is uh, actually a single tenant. So you, ha you are basically provided with a, a set of virtual machines that you, you maintain if, if needed uh, and you are be being charged for. Uh, on the other hand, the reason why event hubs uh, are cheaper is basically because they are multi-tenant. So we are sharing the hardware infrastructure among multiple users. Okay, let's take another, another uh, part or, or another layer. Let's talk about streaming now. So um, I'm not sure whether this is the most common uh, now because we've got, for example, Spark streaming. Uh, but when it comes to like a proper uh, streaming solutions and something that has a long, uh, lo uh, long legacy, uh, the most common one is probably Apache Storm. 
so what it does basically, again, it's uh, always distributed real-time data processing framework, as they call it. Uh, it's really, really fast. It's very scalable. Uh, the challenge I see is the fact that it is very also low level. So um, this is uh, like a usual architecture. It just consists of uh, two major parts. There are spouts that are kind of data ingesters. And there are bolts, which basically provide some business logic on top of the data streams. So every time some message or event appears in one of those spouts, as long as they are connected to uh, some bolts, typically a series of them, then the processing starts. So it's very, let's say, straightforward, but it's very low level. So for example, there is no out-of-the-box uh, transaction support. So if you would like to not just focus on a single event, but a series of them, which usually, usually happens, then you need to look for some, uh, some alternatives. There are some uh, ad additional abstraction levels, like Trident, for example, that provides you with, for, for example, trans transaction support, but this is not like a, an out-of-the-box solution, so you need to be, be aware of it. There is also uh, an experimental project called Storm SQL that uh, uh, plans to provide a uh, you know, more convenient way of uh, data processing, but it's still kind of uh, not, it's far away from, from, from being in production. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to those spouts, they can be very easily connected to uh, other open source projects like Kafka, HDFS, HBase, Solar, Cassandra, and others. Uh, again, the reason is the same like uh, as with Kafka, right? So open source community and the fact that it is very close to the rest of the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. So what can we compare uh, Apache Storm to? Well, the usual suspect is stream analytics. Uh, so let's take stream analytics as, a, as an example here. Um, again, multi-tenant service, if you are talking about pricing, definitely stream analytics will be, will be cheaper, at least for the first phase of the project. It's definitely good to think ahead and look from the at least mid-term perspective how much will you pay when the proper volume of data will land in the system. But I would say that still uh, stream analytics will be more cost-optimized solution. Uh, the deployment model, um, again, Apache Storm can be provided as managed service, so it's coming as a, as a platform as a service, same as with uh, stream analytics. I put an asterisk here because you know, this is platform as a service, meaning you can very easily uh, provision the service, but you need to know actually what you're doing. You can actually have administrative rights. You can actually connect to, those, to this cluster and do some really bad things. So that's uh, kind of something in between of infrastructure and platform. And extensibility, stream analytics has definitely lower extensibility, so you, you can't actually connect it to multiple sources outside of the ones that, that are provided by default. Uh, which is actually quite a lot if you're Azure developer, so you should, you should be satisfied. A deployment complexity, very, very low uh, compared to Apache Storm. As I said, it takes a while to basically understand how Storm is working. Uh, cost, um, definitely lower when it comes to stream analytics. Open source support, stream analytics, not really. I have not seen a lot of open source projects willing or starting to, you know, to connect to stream analytics at this stage. Uh, same with open source support. Programmability, this is definitely the biggest difference, right? So in stream analytics, we are just using SQL. while well, it can be extended with, uh, with, with JavaScript functions. For Apache Storm, uh, it's mostly Java, uh, and there are obviously some bindings even to .NET if, if you wish to. So the biggest difference is actually uh, the way you look at the business logic. If it's simple enough that it can be expressed using SQL, then definitely go ahead and use stream analytics. If it takes you know, a more complex computation, probably Storm or some other you know, uh, lower level approach might be more, more relevant. Uh, and Power BI integration, yes, it's, it's coming natively with stream analytics for Apache Storm. It can be achieved, but using a little bit more effort. And then we've got batch processing. I just chose Apache Spark because nobody is talking about Hadoop anymore. So if you're still thinking that Hadoop is mostly map, map reduce, it's not, right? It's actually far away from that. Most of the people are not uh, build, uh, building or, 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 or developing map reduce jobs. Um, as I said, it's al al almost completely displaced uh, map reduced mindset, um, uh, mostly by the fact that it's, first of all, much faster. 
and also much more convenient for developers, which is basically the, does the trick. Um, why is it more convenient? Because it provides a consi consistent framework. Uh, you've seen on the first slide how complex Hadoop ecosystem looked like six years ago. Now it's much more streamlined. So we can have single uh, framework uh, for developers that is not just forcing you to learn a very specific language, because Spark, by the way, supports multiple languages now. It's not just Scala, it's also uh, R and Python. Um, and on top of it, uh, you can run pretty much any workload that, uh, workload that you need. It can be uh, batch processing, it can be streaming, it can be even machine learning, uh, building machine learning models as well, or uh, using it for uh, graphical um, representations. Um, okay, so if you will take Spark as an open source uh, um, representative, what can we compare it to when it comes to Azure? Well, we may take, for example, Azure Data Lake Analytics, which is uh, one of the services that are again coming uh, as a proprietary part of, of Azure. Um, and once again, depends on the, on, the, on the scenario. I would say that in w when Data Lake Analytics fits your scenario, it will be cheaper than Spark. Um, the reason is that the, 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 the pricing model is quite different uh, for these two. So Spark, again, uh, requires a pre-configured set of virtual machines that are quite, uh, usually quite, quite big. So you are basically paying for the whole cluster. When it comes to data like analytics, you are basically being charged by each of the queries that will be submitted to the, uh, to the, to the service. Um, so uh, deployment model, similar to Storm and, and uh, Stream Analytics, you can see this asterisk when it, when it comes to, to platform. Extensibility, um, again, this, this might be questionable whether uh, data like analytics has higher uh, extensibility, but let's say it, is, it, it does. Um, Cross-platform, unfortunately, data like analytics, as I said, is, this is our proprietary, proprietary thing. The biggest difference from the technical perspective is this last row. So the use case. Uh, data lake analytics is dealing purely with batch processing. So it serves very well when it comes to batch layer, but it's not sufficient for, for stream processing. There is no way you can, you can do any uh, ad hoc queries on top of this data. So just be aware that, uh, that this, this is basically the, the situation like that. And then uh, this is kind of extension to, uh, to my official presentation because we've just released new service don't know how many of you have heard of Azure Databricks? Nobody? Really? Oh, one person. Good, good. So uh, then even better, let me, let me quickly give you an, uh, an introduction to Databricks. Um, so Databricks is actually, uh, can be a, a, a solution for most of those uh, services that I've actually covered. Databricks is actually Spark. Uh, and this is properly managed solution. So contrary to what you've seen previously, it does provide you with really nice end user experience. Um, Databricks is actually not new to the market. Uh, this is one of the, uh, actually those are the inventors of Spark. So the most of the contributors are coming from Databricks company. And now we've basically established global alliance with them providing um, Databricks as a first party service. So this is not a marketplace, Azure marketplace uh, solution. This is actually comes as a, you know, a service branded by, by Microsoft. What it does, first of all, it is really nice to use, which is kind of convenient. Uh, you will see in the demo that, it, that it's really compelling, I hope. Uh, it does provide you with the teamwork experience. So what is, what is it basically aiming for? Usually three uh, different kinds of people data engineers, data scientists, and business analysts. Well, I would say that those business analysts are usually using probably some different tools like Power BI, Tableau, or Click, or whatever, uh, or maybe Excel. Um, but when it comes to data scientists, data engineers, this is definitely a go-to tool. When it comes to my recommendation, I would highly, highly focus on, on, on Databricks if you are consider, considering, for example, to learn Spark. So what it does, it does provide you a nice uh, way of exploring the data through notebooks. Uh, don't know if you are familiar with Jupyter or Zeppelin notebooks? Anybody? Okay, just a few of you. So they are not coming with Jupyter or Zeppelin. They provide their custom notebook engine, which is, in my uh, humble opinion, much more convenient than Jupyter, for example. 
Um, they do support all the languages that uh, Spark supports, so it comes together with R, Python, Scala, and SQL. Uh, it has built-in collaboration, uh, so integration with Git, uh, GitHub, for example, or, or Bitbucket. Uh, it comes together with nice visualizations, embedded ones, and also accessibility through some open source libraries, as you can see. And moreover, it can also uh, either integrate with Power BI direct directly, or it actually has some built-in dashboarding engine, so we can use it for, for dashboards out of the box. On the other hand, uh, so that was the story for, let's say, end user. On the other hand, if you are a data engineer especially, you can, first of all, take those notebooks, so the pieces of code that you've built during exploration phase, and, and stitch them all together. So you can, for example, combine them and create a single workflow, programmatic work work workflow, which is quite, quite unique. There is also built-in job scheduler, so you can take those notebooks and throw them into, s into some scheduling engine, so they will be running continuously every, every uh, predefined uh, period of time. And there is also uh, notifications and logs uh, or alerts built into the system as well for, to help you, for example, troubleshoot some, 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 uh, some, some jobs. Uh, by the fact that this, this is coming as the first party service, this also means that we are uh, working on very tight integration with rest of Azure services. So, for example, na native integration with uh, Data Warehouse, Cosmos DB, Data Lake Store, Blob Storage, Event Hub, Power BI, etc. And then, uh, the last but definitely not the least, is the technology underneath. So, first of all, it's much, much faster than original Spark. So, if you take open source Spark and run it on the same infrastructure, this one will be, they, Databricks claim, up to seven times faster. Right, so when it comes to large data processing, it definitely makes the difference. They are using some proprietary protocols, also some caching mechanisms to make to make it running so fast. Uh, the biggest deal for me is this is very close to serverless appro approach, uh, and also provides you with uh, obviously uh, REST uh, API extensibility. So let's basically, uh, and I will hopefully have uh, a few minutes left to to cover the demo. Let's see how it how it looks like. So once you log into the system, this is uh, uh, what you what you are ex actually exposed to. It's not Azure Portal anymore. So once you create inside your subscription Azure Databricks service, this is basically what you what you will see. It is tightly integrated with Azure uh, Active Directory, so you can't actually log in using different uh, authentication mechanism. You you need to rely on uh, AD, which is obviously good from the enterprise user's perspective. And this is like a set of examples that are coming out of the box. But first thing you need to, to do, and this is maybe not, uh, um, not obvious, you need to create cluster. And uh, you may ask, okay, so what I am looking uh, at now if there's no cluster? Uh, well, actually there is one cluster running as you can see, but first of all, there is additional abstraction layer. So it's not just separation of data from the compute engine, but also compute engine from the business logic that you, that you can see here. So first of all, it gives you a very nice flexibility so I can, for example, that allocate certain uh, compute resources for certain individual or maybe certain department or, or team without, uh, within my company. So in this case, I have uh, one main cluster running. It just consists of three nodes, so it's not really uh, you know, any, anything uh, production ready. I can very easily add another cluster uh, and I can either go with the, the serverless approach, so I just provide cluster name and maybe the information about the size of the, uh, of the nodes. Uh, or I can obviously be exposed to some more, uh, uh, sorry, this is, this is serverless. So that's like almost no configuration information. Or I can go with the standard or more advanced way of configuring the, the cluster. And here you can see, for example, a very nice feature called auto-scaling. This is not common. This is something that we've not provided in the past, but here it comes together with the service so we can define the minimum and maximum number of nodes that will be allocated for your, for your users. And depending on the workload, if it gets really complex, for, so the job, job queue basically uh, is longer than expected, there will be some more resources allocated for the users. And probably the, the, the most interesting feature for me personally is the fact that you can automatically terminate the cluster after a certain time of inactivity. This is very common to me when I'm doing a, a lot of big data demos. 
I forget forget about closing those those the, the, this these clusters, and it's obviously generating quite a lot of consumption. So I don't want to pay for it. This way, I can very easily shut them down automatically. So this is like infrastructure, and as I said, I can have multiple clusters, uh, and each of these clusters can be allocated to different workload, different scenario. So how those scenarios look like? I don't have time to unfortunately give you an introduction to Spark framework. So if you are not um, familiar uh, with Spark, I highly recommend, first of all, learning Spark. Uh, but just to give you a hands-on experience, this is uh, the notebook that comes uh, as one of the tutorials. And this is called Introduction to Structured Streaming, meaning, meaning this is somehow equi equivalent to streaming, uh, stream analytics, Azure Stream Analytics. Um, it is written in Python in this, uh, sorry, uh, this is, uh, yeah, the cluster is Scala, but all the, con uh, all, all the code is written in Python. Um, and the basic scenario is as follows. We do have a, a bunch of JSON files that basically emulate some data stream. So you can imagine those files as uh, JSON messages appearing in, for example, Kafka or Event Hub. I can very easily connect it to Event Hub, even, uh, even though for now it's just relying on some um, uh, blob storage content, right? So you can see the content of some, um, uh, some folder. Those are those JSON files. I can look inside this file and this is basically the content. So you can see a set of very basic messages, JSON messages. There is just a timestamp and action. So nothing really fancy here. Um, and then I can start some processing. So first thing, I obviously need to define some schema. And this is the way you construct schema on top of these uh, events. So it's just, as I said, time and action. Uh, and from now on, I can apply a certain set of transformations and then display, display them all together. So I'm ba basically reading this schema and throwing it in the structured manner to the, to the output, so to the console. And this is basically the table that has been created out of those JSON messages. So this is how I'm mapping the JSON onto some quasi-relational schemas, let's say. And then you can see that I can actually start and do some, um, um, uh, some nice processing. So first of all, based on that schema, I'm creating a temporal view. So it will become eventually a view or a table. Uh, so uh, it would make, make uh, things much more convenient because from now on, I can switch from Python to using SQL. And this is actually what happens here in the next, uh, next step. So you can see that I'm basically applying certain select statement, and I'm using one of these built-in visualization capabilities that is uh, coming uh, out of the box. So you can see, for example, the number of open and close uh, actions all together. And obviously, there are uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, different visualizations. So this is still relying on some static data that is stored in, uh, inside the blobs. But I can very easily switch it to actual streams. So let's say, OK, uh, this is the part that has been dealing with uh, batch processing. It might take hours to, I don't know, complete processing of a few terabytes of data. What about streams? Actually, the biggest difference that uh, has happened between the code that you've seen previously and the one that, you, that you're seeing here is that instead of the read uh, method, I'm using read stream. And that's all. That's all that, that is actually required to, uh, to switch from batch processing to stream processing. So you can see, actually, that there is some uh, uh, work uh, or job uh, currently running. I can actually have a look here. And this is the actual, uh, let's say, stream simulator. So you can see that there are still, like, every five seconds, I believe, there is an update happening. And based on this stream, I can, again, apply the same selects. So those selects are actually coming real time. And as I said, you can very easily take this notebook and either make it running as a job uh, in a scheduler or take some of those visualizations, for example, and place it directly in, in some, of the uh, some uh, sort of the dashboard. So that's, um, that's Databricks. Um, uh, the last part is the serving layer. So, so let's, uh, let's very quickly uh, go through uh, alternatives here. As I said, in both those two scenarios, the, these customers were using um, uh, HBase. So this is why I, I selected HBase as well. It's very popular. Again, NoSQL Big Data Store, again, coming as uh, Azure Managed Service. Uh, if you would be looking for HBase, just uh, have a look at uh, HD Insight uh, uh, Azure Services. There is a template for, for HBase. Uh, it's column-oriented. 
it doesn't come with a native uh, syntax support, so you can't actually rely on SQL. There are some exter uh, external projects that provide you with such uh, capabilities. It is very nice to scale, so it can, you can easily consume billions of rows per second. Uh, you can have even millions of columns uh, in the same table, which is for some of the users convenient. High availability and uh, failover is ob ob obviously built in. It is obviously also part of um, Hadoop Stack, so it does rely on MapReduce, Spark, HDFS, etc. We can compare it. This is again my uh, arbitrary choice to, for example, Cosmos DB. Again, multi-tenant versus no deployment model, uh, sort of similar deployment complexity, kind of again quite similar. I would say that entry cost is definitely on the Cosmos DB side because we are paying just for the storage. Uh, and and uh, also there are some computation units allocated for that. But it will not start high if you need to provide the full cluster. Uh, then programmability, uh, you can see different languages that are supported. So I would not say that Cosmos DB, DB is uh, somewhat limited in this, in this field. The biggest difference is uh, use cases. And Cosmos DB is uh, very flexible nowadays. It not just supports documents, but also key values, graphs, it does talk MongoDB protocol and also Cassandra's protocol as well. So it can basically very effectively replace already existing systems. So uh, to finish, very quick cost comparison that I've done for, uh, for uh, the first of the, those cases. If, uh, if you will stick to the infrastructure, so take it as it is, lift and shift and put it into the system, this is, by the way, list prices, right? So I'm not talking about any discounts. Uh, you might recall HBase, Storm, uh, Kafka plus NiFi. Uh, so this is basically uh, the three separate clusters that need to be allocated for this purpose. Plus some storage, Postgres, because they've been using Postgres as well. The monthly total is roughly 16K. If we would take it and use more optimized resources like IoT Hub, Stream Analytics, maybe some app services, etc. It, it goes down to roughly 7K. So the difference is obviously huge. And guess what? They are still using this one, right? So I, I have nothing against that. If they want to pay, you know, 10K bucks per month more, then it's fine for us, obviously. You may ask why. And those are the decision criteria that you need to take, take into account. Obviously, TCO is one of the crucial ones. So this is why I'm presenting you with these tables. If you are a cloud architect, you can't avoid those tables, right? those sort of comparisons. It's not about technology anymore. It's also about the business. So we need to prove that it actually makes sense from the business perspective. So TCO is definitely one thing to consider. Flexibility, another very important thing. right? So are you willing to become sort of vendor locked in or not? You'd like to have full flexibility. You'd like to migrate across clouds or maybe go back with this solution to some on-prem system. Support and SLA, also extremely crucial. Right? So if you look at uh, all those open source components, somebody needs to maintain them. Either you have those resources in place or you need to acquire them somewhere externally. This also will cost you some money. And management requirements. If you really want to you know, throw everything in the cloud and forget about you know, management, so be it. But maybe you have, you, you'd like to have full control over it. So that's, that's basically the question. Things not to bother, in my opinion. Vendor lock-in, I mean, you will be locked to some technology anyway. You can be locked into a commercial technology or open source technology. The migration is always painful, right? So you can't avoid it, no matter what. If you cho chose Kafka and would like to switch to, I don't know, Rabbit or anything else, it will be painful, right? So it doesn't really matter, you know, long term. And previous experiences, you need to learn something new, after all. And if you're a developer, then probably you like it already, so why bother? So summary, architecture is state of mind, not a product. I just compared uh, a few of the services that are available on top of Azure, but also available freely on the market. Uh, just think, you know, in the broader terms, from the broader uh, perspective. Cloud solutions are perfectly suited to utilize and build Lambda architecture. Uh, pick and choose wi wisely, so obviously you need to commit to certain technology for at least a few months, quarters, or years. But obviously in the next six months there will be new shiny product appearing on the market, so 
you will be regret, regretting your decisions anyway. So why should you care? And then obviously the, the next hot, hot topic is serverless approach, which basically makes things much more easier now. Okay, uh, the last slide, as I mentioned, are the references. So uh, some articles that I've mentioned, also some books related to la uh, Lambda architectures, and also all, the, all those uh, detailed, much more detailed comparisons between Azure services and, for example, Kafka and Storm. Um, are there any questions? First of all, Russ, Russ. So f first of all, it was a great, great uh, presentation. Thank you. So, uh, do you have any question? That is one. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I have one question. Uh, currently, the company Confluence built uh, the very powerful platform built on the top of Kafka, uh, which supports KSQL, uh, this Kafka streams, and they say we have Kafka for everything, for data streaming, for analytics. You can substitute it. You can substitute your database with Kafka. Uh, do, can you give any comments to that if we can just use Kafka and don't need anything else? Thank you. Well, if we will go back to the official architecture slide, right? So this one. You can basically put any number of products over here, right? Uh, and I am actually on the constant, uh, constant basis talking to external vendors like Hortonworks. They do have the HDF, HDF platform, which basically claims to do all that stuff, right? Cloudera, the same thing. They claim they, they can easily you know, replace some of this stuff with their own proprietary system. So obviously, this is like a commercial story. How do you position your product? I honestly believe that, at least for now, uh, the best approach would be not to rely so heavily on single vendor, especially when I'm hearing Kafka is able to compete effectively with uh, projects that are mature enough and have been tested you know, for, for many years. I would you know, take, take it with a grain of salt, meaning uh, I would rather wait for some proper you know, uh, large-scale references. Uh, for now, I see that you know, we, uh, using especially cloud approach, we've got a lot of flexibility and we can pick and choose and play and test very different, uh, different flavors of, uh, of, of components. So um, it's hard for me to decide whether you know, Kafka will win this race, will win this race long term. For now, this is basically, uh, when it comes to open source projects, this is what I see the, uh, uh, happening the, uh, the most, uh, in most of the cases. So. Um, you can obviously try to uh, make a more objective decision. For example, try to look at the number of contributors or obviously number of cases or references, maybe uh, look at the financial results of certain companies. Um, there is no easy answer to that. Uh, as I said, architecture is state of mind, not a product, right? And that's something that I would like to leave you with. Any other questions? Thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding uh, Databricks. For instance, I want to switch from Jupyter to Databricks with Python. How much will it cost me when I want to use just Databricks with uh, machine learning, for example? So if you're using, I assume that you're using Spark already or not? Uh, no. No. Okay, and what kind of uh, uh, libraries? Scikit-learn or some? Yep. Well, so uh, depends on, uh, the, the way you'd like to use Spark for, you can obviously write, uh, run uh, Jupyter Notebooks as they are. So there is, uh, I believe, a migration or converter for Jupyter Notebooks to Databricks Notebook, Notebook. so it's kind, it should be you know, very straightforward. Uh, the code should be running as it is, but it's all the matter of scalability. So if you are struggling, for example, with some of those algorithms that they are you know, taking too much time or they, do, they are not able to process all the data that you have, then you might consider using MLIP, which is like a default machine learning library that comes together with, uh, with, uh, with Spark and obviously have, uh, have uh, Python bindings. So you need to consider you know, whether, for example, how to take s some of the models that uh, are running on top of uh, scikit-learn and take some, some, some algorithms from, from MLIP. It shouldn't be really th that hard. If you'd like to, we can discuss afterwards and 
Okay, and another question. How are you dealing with the absence of uh, specialists in uh, Lambda? For example, Kafka is quite a hype technology, while the other is not that popular. Other meaning what exactly? Event Hub uh, yes. or IoT Hub? Yep. Well, this is why we are all here for, right? This is Azure <laughs> Day, so I'm hoping that you will be inspired to learn something new, right? Actually, you know, this whole data ingestion story is something that I treat as a mandatory and obvious, but not really very sexy, right? So the data needs to, to come somewhere and be stored somewhere in some sort of the, of the buffer. If it's Kafka, Event Hub, Srabbit, I don't really care as a developer. It's just a matter of, you know, proper connection, uh, connection string or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, there are obviously more specialists with, with regards to Kafka versus Event Hubs. On the other hand, it takes five minutes for me to run Event Hubs uh, service, whereas, you know, at least 30 minutes to provision Kafka ser uh, server on top, of, on top of Azure. So that gives you kind of a, a, a difference that even, even Hubs being managed service does not require any management at all. So we need obviously Kafka uh, uh, experience and, and Kafka you know, uh, resources in place because somebody, because somebody needs to take care of the clusters. In, in, even sub, uh, in, in, in even Hubs case, there is no need for them, which is good and, and bad. <laughs> So, unfortunately, we are limited in time. So, uh, if you have any question, you can ask uh, uh, d during the break. Uh, but right now, we need to choose the most uh, interesting uh, question. Ah, it's going to be tough. Uh, <laughs> there are two of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, what can I say? Um, do we have some random generator? Probably <laughs> yeah, not random number generator. Not, um, let, let's pick the first one, right? For 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 the, for the fact that you've been the first one, right? So th that's basically it. No offense, sorry. <laughs> uh, the gentleman over okay. there. Yeah. What, what kind of size do you have for 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 <laughs> for, 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 t for t shirt? At least you've avoided some, as, you know, some questions. <laughs> 